research interests are in labor economics and environmental of labor economics. He is a holder of Netherlands Fellowship awarded by the Dutch government uh, during his study. He was awarded with Sanjay Thakur Young Labor Economist Award for his work in labor economics. So I would request sir to start with the proceedings. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so good evening. Uh, I thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, now with the reference to, uh, you know, the uh, budget in specific, uh, I think there are different uh, ways of really uh, looking at it. Uh, now, one can uh, look at it simply as uh, some kind of a, a revenue expenditure statement of the government. Uh, but why should we be really uh, discussing about such a mundane thing, uh, you know, with such great seriousness? Uh, is because uh, it plays a very, very significant role uh, in a particular kind of economic as well as uh, political sense. And in that sense, therefore, we need to first of all understand uh, what is the role that this particular budget, uh, you know, uh, was expected to play. And uh, what is it that it really has as its uh, contents? And given uh, you know this budget, to what extent does it really manage to deliver the kind of expectations? Uh, and the possible trajectory uh, you know, from here on as a consequence to uh, the manner or the mode in which uh, this particular uh, intervention has come in. Now, first, uh, if we have to really uh, talk about the relevance of this uh, you know, budget or put it in a context. Uh, economists generally go with this idea that, uh, you know, in an economic context, if you start looking at the uh, economy as uh, some kind of a circular flow, you would have a variety of components uh, across which the entire or the totality of, uh, you know, national uh, income gets distributed. Now, with reference to uh, you know, these components, you would have on one hand the households, uh, on the other hand you would have the uh, private businesses uh, and the orthodox understanding is that together both these, uh, you know, uh, economic agents uh, ought to be, you know, consuming or expending in the form of uh, either investments or in the form of personal uh, consumption, they ought to be absorbing or uh, utilizing all the different you know goods and services that are produced in an economy uh, in a year. Now, with reference to what actually happens uh, in an economy, it is quite possible that uh, the output which exists in the economy is not adequately absorbed. Uh, now, why that happens uh, is what is described as a situation of recession. That if an economy is in a contractionary mode, then households fear that, uh, you know, the future uh, is bleak and there's a possibility that we might, uh, you know, have to endure unemployment and as a consequence to which they may not really expend their money for you know current consumption similarly investors who are already uh, in a sense unable to sell their commodities they find it uh, you know irrational to invest more uh, and uh, therefore uh, either in terms of employing more number of people or buying uh, you know more number of inputs so as to produce output it makes no sense to them therefore they also uh, you know do not really uh, invest uh, and as a consequence to which then uh, the economy starts actually contracting. Now, if you look at the historical condition in which uh, we are in, if you were to compare uh, with uh, the you know 2012 uh, data, the total uh, you know consumption expenditure stood at around uh, say 59 percent of the uh, total uh, you know national income, or rather the uh, you know the expenditure. Uh, and with reference to the uh, investments, uh, it stood uh, somewhere around, uh, you know, I think 38-39%. Uh, uh, now by 2021, 
uh, we have a situation where the consumption has uh, contracted uh, to about uh, 53% uh, and the investments have contracted to about 32%. <coughs> so clearly uh, this is a condition where uh, you know you are in a contractionary mode. Now whereas uh, in the past uh, you know you had much much more activity uh, happening on both these counts uh, you seem to be uh, in a sense of uh, 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 you know, retracting from the kind of either investments or uh, household level uh, expenditures. Now, why this has happened is a complicated question because uh, you know there are large number of reasons why uh, an economy might go into a contractionary mode. Uh, we perhaps uh, began contracting uh, post demonetization, uh, and then eventually you have had uh, COVID. Uh, and then uh, third, uh, you have had the international, uh, you know, uh, crisis, uh, especially the Ukraine war, right, which has suddenly, uh, in a sense, steeply uh, uh, increased the prices of food or fuel, uh, and it has uh, starved the economies uh, in uh, on several counts. Therefore, uh, and uh, as a consequence to which, then, uh, you know, as I said, as a as a result of cumulative uh, reasons, you are. Currently in a situation where there is tremendously high unemployment on one side and a very, very uh, you know, steep kind of an inflationary situation that the economy finds itself in. Now, if both these, uh, in a sense, are high, that happens under uh, you know, circumstances of a recessionary phase. Uh, that if you are growing, actually, you, know, you tend to uh, see a certain kind of a trade-off. Uh, between uh, you know unemployment and inflation, inflation might play uh, you know the role of uh, incentives uh, because if you are producing at a lower cost and the lag period uh, you know comes in and then you sell at a higher price, then you make positive returns. So there's it is profitable to uh, have a certain percentage of inflation under circumstances where you are growing, but when you are contracting, when there is no demand and your cost of production is uh, you know increasing, then it actually spirals into a greater contraction, greater unemployment. So it is this circumstance which actually makes the budget a very significant kind of an intervention. Now that's a pure kind of an economic uh, you know, perspective in a very, very pragmatic sense as to what is it that a budget really does uh, under circumstances where an economy is going into some kind of a recessionary mode. There is also a deep, uh, you know, political kind of a statement that a budget is, because uh, you know, with reference to the kind of lofty ideals that are enshrined in our constitution, we have promised to this republic that we will give opportunities to everybody. We have promised to this republic that we will reduce inequalities in wealth and income. That we have, uh, you know, a vision uh, to promote uh, equality amongst different sections of society. So in a sense, when those economic ideals come into interface uh, with the political challenges, and the political challenges, mind you, uh, or the objectives have to be seen as intrinsically meaningful in themselves, uh, that whether or not they in turn are, are you know, seen in, in the economic language as being productive, as uh, you know, uh, being profitable and so on, irrespective of that, that these are social objectives, political objectives, which are ideals that a society has to achieve as civilizational, uh, you know, goods that, uh, you know, the, these are uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, what can be seen as uh, desirable in terms of the kind of society that we would like to have. So therefore, uh, a budget, uh, in a sense, therefore, is also an agency, agency of the oppressed, agency of the vulnerable. It is a political statement. It actually talks about you know, what is the kind of uh, valuation that you give to these uh, ideals that are enshrined in the constitution. So to that extent, therefore, when you evaluate a budget, you ought to be doing it on several counts and not merely look at it as a, a kind of a mundane, uh, you know, economic, uh, uh, you know, a pragmatic economic intervention to fix uh, some economic problem uh, and so on, although that is also equally uh, significant and uh, important. Now, with reference to the kind of uh, context and situation that I've al already narrated, where we find ourselves in a condition of recession, the question is whether this budget has the kind of fix 
or the promise uh, to really address the problem of uh, recession? Does it have the problem, you know, that is, does it have the uh, ability to fix the problem of unemployment? Does it have the ability to fix the problem of inflation? Does it have a promise of actually being inclusive? Now, in terms of how the finance minister has, you know, through the course of her uh, speech, tried to put across what she uh, has put in the budget, <coughs> rhetorically, uh, you know, she began with the idea of, uh, you know, inclusion, right, inclusive development. So she uh, spoke uh, about uh, the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes, uh, you know, the backward caste, uh, you know, women, uh, and so on, right? So, the question here is, uh, on one count, uh, how does it really address all these different sections of society? Uh, what are the kind of major uh, heads uh, in which they have really allocated the budget? So, you have, uh, say, uh, uh, about, uh, you know, 47 lakh crores, uh, of the total uh, uh, expenditure that the government uh, intends to make. And uh, on the face of it, you uh, see that they have allocated 10 lakh crores, right, to what they call as the capital expenditure, right, on, uh, you know, major infrastructure uh, building throughout the country. Now, that would mean your highways, right, a variety of, uh, you know, infrastructural uh, uh, facilities that are likely to come through. Uh, second major, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 heading uh, which, uh, you know, the uh, expenditure surface is, of course, uh, the expenditure on defense, right, which is uh, close to about 13 percent. Now, uh, 33 percent of that capex plus the 13 percent of this, uh, that totals to about 46 percent. 20 percent goes towards debt servicing, right, so that's about 66 percent gone. Right. Uh, I think another uh, two lakh crores uh, is uh, in the railways, uh, and then what is left, therefore, right, uh, is uh, the kind of uh, investments uh, which, in the name of uh, either rural development, agricultural development, I think uh, you know, uh, Professor Lakshmanaran would uh, deal with uh, the uh, agricultural investments and so on, uh, in a, in a lot more detail. Uh, so, a variety of these uh, investments uh, also include as a component the social sector, right, which uh, is hardly, uh, you know, maybe uh, 6 or 7 percent, right, of the uh, total, uh, you know, kind of uh, expenditure that uh, has been done. Because a lot of expenditure in the name of education, in the name of, uh, you know, vulnerable groups has actually been done, uh, you know, feeding uh, either the millers or the uh, you know, intermediaries uh, or a variety of, uh, you know, uh, technology-based, uh, 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 you know, uh, enterprises. Now, with respect to uh, the other side of this story, uh, which is that, uh, you know, in terms of how you approach the recession itself, right from uh, the demonetization days onwards, uh, you have seen a massive contraction in what is called as the unorganized sector. Now, this unorganized sector or the informal sector uh, absorbs close to about 93% right, of all the labor that is available. So, 93% of employment is in this sector. Now, there is a, uh, you know, a, a State Bank of India uh, you know, a report uh, you know, which has come out uh, recently, which uh, basically says that in comparison to uh, the kind of value added that was happening by the uh, unorganized sector uh, in 2017-18, which was uh, close to about 50%, uh, has contracted in comparison to anywhere between 15 to 20% 20 by 2021. So this massive contraction of the unorganized sector is uh, in close to about 15 different kinds of commodity groups. Now that would include, uh, you know, your uh, uh, food, uh, your dairy industry. Uh, a variety of, uh, you know, fibers, uh, textile, leather, uh, you know, your construction materials, uh, wood, uh, you know, and, and other, uh, you know, wood products, uh, electric, uh, you know, uh, goods, uh, and so on. So, variety of these uh, commodities that are there in the unorganized sector, and, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, figures 
uh, with reference to uh, even the number of enterprises is, is quite startling. Because in all, if you have about, uh, say, some uh, six and a half crore enterprises, only 0.3 of these enterprises are in the organized sector. 99.7% of the entire activity <coughs> is happening in the unorganized sector. Now, with reference to, uh, you know, this quantum of uh, activity that is taking place in terms of livelihoods, in terms of, uh, you know, employment and so on, uh, its value added or its, uh, uh, you know, contribution is seen as close to about 30% of the uh, GDP. Now, the point is that when the unorganized sector contracts so massively, uh, it does affect, you know, in terms of the being the backward end supply chain for the organized sector, because it provides auxiliary, uh, you know, uh, materials, a variety of inputs, raw materials uh, to the organized sector as well. So the point here is that, uh, you know, while on the face of it, uh, whatever is that 32% of the uh, you know, new investments that have come in, uh, you know, in the in the uh, organized sector uh, segment. Uh, you should also see that uh, you know the government is claiming that uh, it, through the course of COVID, uh, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, whereas that investment stood at say uh, around 30 percent, uh, now it has moved to 32 percent. So they are looking at this as a recovery, uh, and they are believing that the economy is actually in an expansionary phase. But what the, uh, you know, critical economists are really looking at is that which is not actually captured by the official data in any systematic manner, and that is to do with the unorganized sector and its impact and the connect uh, that it has vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis constraining uh, the expansion of the organized sector. And here, uh, you know, the uh, critical thinking is uh, suggesting that if you have to really revive uh, the unorganized sector, the kind of investments that have uh, been, uh, you know, planned in this budget, certainly it is of no use. Uh, because what is happening is, if you talk about, say, something like, uh, you know, this this capex, right, the, the 10 lakh uh, crore capex, uh, and if you look at what might uh, possibly be the impact on, uh, you know, employment generation, uh, you find that given the nature of technology that is being employed, uh, in building the, uh, you know, recent uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, you know, you see all these, uh, uh, you know, prefabricated, uh, you know, flyovers. You see the kind of mechanization that has taken place even in ordinary road laying that, uh, you know, this ratio is put at somewhere around uh, per every four crore investment, you are likely to generate one job, right? Uh, and that leaves you with uh, perhaps something like uh, maybe 25 lakh uh, you know, uh, jobs uh, as a consequence of this massive, uh, you know, investment of 33% of the entire budget. Now, in that sense, therefore, this great optimism that government has with reference to reviving employment on the basis of this massive uh, investment is perhaps, uh, you know, uh, misplaced. And we find, uh, to our surprise, you know, people like, uh, you know, Amitabh Khan, uh, you know, Ashok Gulati, you know, all these names in the Nagarajan, they come on the TV and I don't know which, uh, on which planet they really live on. So they are talking about uh, India becoming a developed country by 2047. Now here is a situation where, you know, Oxfam has come up with a report suggesting that there is a massive problem of starvation. You have the, uh, you know, multidimensional poverty indices which talks about how poverty has intensified, right, uh, you know, over the uh, 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 last uh, year. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have uh, several, uh, you know, such uh, reports, uh, including uh, one which has been uh, produced by the IMF, right, which is uh, basically trying to say that through the course of pandemic, perhaps there is actually intensification of poverty. Now, as I said, there are two ways of really looking at, uh, you know, how you are fixing the problem. One way is to really try and think in terms of uh, what is the quantum of value that you are likely to reap in terms of profits, right, uh, on the basis of each rupee that you invest uh, into the economy. And on this count, of course, you know, you may say that India will grow 
and grow uh, you know massively but what does this growth really mean to the millions of people in terms of our own citizens in terms of the nation what does it really mean where would this wealth really go and to this uh, you know if you were to really uh, you know try and uh, look at the work of chancel and piketty uh, who have uh, tried to uh, come up uh, with the estimations of uh, the growing inequalities uh, in india uh, you see that you know they have classified the income groups uh, you know on the on the basis of uh, a certain uh, cut off uh, income so average uh, of the bottom uh, 50% of the uh, lowest of the income earners is around 40000 uh, the middle 40% uh the the benchmarking is around say 1 lakh rupees and the top 10% uh, you begin at uh, you know something like uh, 7 lakhs and then uh, you know it it goes up now what they point out is that from 70s to 2015 you have a major kind of a shift uh, in the way that incomes have got distributed across these income groups in comparison to what happened between uh of course they go back into 1922 on what but if, even if you were to really look at uh from the post independence period 50s to 70s uh you find that uh consumption levels of uh, the bottom 50 and the middle 40 have increased and it is the top uh, you know 10% that actually contracts marginally but over a period of this uh you know 70s to the 2015 period the middle 40 and the bottom 50 actually show a reduction uh, in the in the total relative proportional share of their income in the total income of the you know the, the national income uh, such that uh, the the middle 40% and the bottom 50% uh, you know uh, uh, start uh, you know merely owning something like maybe if i recollect correctly about 29% right and whereas the top a 10% right knock off the rest of the uh, you know incomes the way that uh, relatively the incomes have uh, increased they point out that whereas with reference to the bottom 50% in comparison to what uh, their incomes were in the 70s uh, by 2015 their incomes have gone up by about 95% whereas the top 10% their incomes have gone up by around 400% of course they split that 10% in further into you know 1% uh, you know whose incomes have gone up by about 900% point uh, 0.1% uh, you know whose incomes have gone up by about 1600% point 0.1% whose incomes have gone up by about 2000% now this massive kind of inequality and the uh, uh, you know complete change in the structure of distribution of incomes and we are today talking about uh, you know how this budget has contributed in some sense to the middle classes and to the poor and let us look at what really has been done with reference to say something like the tax structure now with reference to the tax structure there is a new uh, you know kind of a tax regime that has been introduced uh, wherein up to 7 lakhs uh, there is no tax and then there are slabs beyond that so between 0 to uh, you know 3 lakhs beyond the 7 lakhs uh, you have no tax uh, 3 to 6 lakhs uh, you know you have about 5% uh, 6 to 9 lakhs you have 10% 9 to 12 lakhs you have about 15% above 15 uh, you know uh, uh, lakhs you have about 30% that's the kind of a tax slab uh, that has been created now the estimates suggest that this particular tax slab uh, leaves an additional income of about 2500 rupees with uh, you know the 0 uh, to 3 uh, uh, lakh category that is beyond 7 so we are talking about the 10 lakh uh, income bracket uh, and it leaves about maybe you know 3500 uh with the second 4500 6 9000 and it goes on up to 25000 now paralleling this they have also given concessions to the high valued uh, you know persons as they call it that is the 7 crore bracket so somebody who makes 7 crore rupees per annum for them there is a certain reduction in the surcharge 
on the income tax uh, from you know something like uh, 32 percent i think to 25 percent which estimates again suggest are likely to leave about 25 lakh rupees in their hands now in comparison to these changes which have been made uh, to the middle class incomes and the super rich uh, incomes you have seen a massive cut in the uh, mg nregea uh, in food and fertilizer subsidies uh, in uh, health as well as uh, you know education expenditure now education expenditure for instance their claim is that it is one of the highest that is based on the absolute figure you know 1 lakh uh, 12000 crores but if you look at the overall trend uh, of of expenditure on uh, education as a percentage of gdp it has come down to about uh, you know 0.32% uh, right it, it, it was uh, at around 0.64% uh, uh, it has come down actually to about 0.32% similarly with reference to health expenditures what is the nature of these allocations mostly it is going to information dissemination or uh, to setting up of uh, you know these uh, uh, 5g gadgets it's all subserving again the it industry not as much serving the uh, victims of a variety of you know tropical diseases uh, you know health care or, or taking care of what is actually seen as the social insecurity right in terms of being exposed to uh, uh, you know what are seen as uh, health shocks instead of taking care of uh, you know those requirements in the name of health expenditure you are basically feeding again a variety of it uh, you know corporates or uh, private uh, hospitals and, and so on uh, i saw in, in one of the responses that the uh, i think uh, one of the representatives of apollo uh, uh, you know hospitals was saying that uh, we are quite happy with this budget uh, because it leaves a lot more money in the pockets of uh, you know the middle classes and mostly health expenditure is out of pocket expenditure now how many people can really uh, you know bear the expenses in a hospital like apollo or any of these corporate hospitals so who is she really uh, you know referring to and uh, who is she expecting uh, to be her clients or uh, you know customers and who is it who is really left out of this entire analysis so in that sense largest sections of the society are completely left out so what is it that uh, you know are uh, really the kind of investments where the sc st you know all these categories come in they have uh, you know uh, allocated about 15000 crores for what they call as the primitive and vulnerable tribal groups and this 15000 crores mind you this is also a peculiar thing this is the last year of the government and it has these 15000 crores allocated for the next 3 years <laughs> so i don't know how uh, you know they expect uh, to be back in power again or maybe they will be they won't be or whatever it is that they can't really do this i mean you can't have uh, expenditure for next 3 years 5 years uh, 20 47 being talked about now uh, when you have just one year to go in the government right uh, so a budget is not everything uh, you, you you should restrict it to what it is for the next one year Uh, but anyway they have lofty uh, you know idea so ultimately what it really boils down to this 15000 crores that has been allocated to close to about uh, you know who uh, account to about say something like 70 lakh people a small segment of the entire tribal community so that uh, eventually becomes something like 11 lakhs per person right and that 11 lakhs is then allocated across seven different programs because you know this money is being allocated for housing for sanitation for health for roads for every damn thing that you can you know imagine so they have seven different programs uh, targeted at the primitive uh, and vulnerable tribal groups right uh, trying to say that therefore uh, it is a, a you know program that subserves the vulnerable groups now with reference to uh, you know the uh, mg nrega program see on one hand if i am saying that a lot of people are unemployed and the unorganized sector has shrunk so a lot of people have lost their livelihoods uh, they are also unemployed a lot of youth are unemployed right so your investment somewhere have to concretely show 
how employment generation is likely to take place. If you cannot do this, then you should at least provide survival opportunities for people instead of driving them into misery. The other program that they have claimed, uh, you know, as representing some kind of a social sectoral investment is the food expenditure. Now, that food expenditure also, in fact, has shown a decline. So, in terms of the actual subsidy that has been alloc allocated for food, there has been a shrinking of that subsidy by about 26%. And that has happened because they have now merged what was called as the, you know, Prime Minister's, uh, I think the, uh, you know, it is the Antodaya uh, kind of a program uh, with... Uh, the PDS, uh, uh, you know, the, the usual kind of uh, uh, food distribution program. And by doing so, they have actually cut the costs or the expenditure on, uh, you know, providing for food. So, similarly, you know, uh, talk about uh, the expenditures that they, uh, you know, they, they have an AWAS program. So, that is housing program. So, they have allocated, say, about 70,000 crores uh, for the housing program. Uh, and just to think of, uh, you know, just to get a sense of what this means. From 2016 onwards until now, they have spent about 7 lakh crores right, uh, on the Avas Yojana and have created about, uh, say, uh, I think 48 lakh units of houses. So, if you have created 48 lakh units of houses from 7 lakh crores of investments, what you can create uh, with an investment of about 70,000 crores, right? boils down to something like, I think, uh, you know, if, I, if my memory serves me right, uh, to about 40,000 additional units of homes. Most of these, again, are likely to feed uh, material providers, you know, cement, steel industry. So, uh, at the back of the mind uh, is in terms of how you are basically feeding the industry. Now, the other side of the story, given the, you know, international backdrop of the massive crisis that we have, we see a current account deficit, we see a massive trade deficit, right, in terms of the international economy and trade scenario. We are seeing our reserves dwindle, right, drastically. We are seeing rupee lose its uh, exchange value. Now, in terms of investing in what is seen as social programs, in terms of investing in what is seen as rural programs, in terms of reviving, uh, you know, the unorganized sector, even the NREGA program, there is a very, very systematic structural connect that the consumption of the poor right, feeds the revival of the unorganized sector, which actually provides for the employment for 93% of you know, the informal and the unorganized uh, employment. Now, if you fail to see this connect, you're basically saying that I'm more interested in reaping growth. My focus is on growth rate. I'm really interested in reviving the economy merely in monetary terms, irrespective of what really happens to people. Now, the question is, even that kind of a revival, is it really feasible and possible? Here comes the other side of the entire, uh, you know, uh, uh, statistic. Now, in terms of uh, what is seen as uh, import, or, or rather, uh, you know, the uh, income uh, elasticity of demand for imports, this middle class as well as the super rich incomes, whose incomes have now been saved much more in their hands as a consequence to the changes made to the tax system. What this actually does is it intensifies the imports because the uh, income elasticity for imported commodities is put around say plus 1.48 uh, you know, points. And in comparison to that, it is also uh, you know, suggested that there is a a price inelasticity, that is, even if there were to be price increases of the imported commodities, these, uh, you know, uh, sections of society wouldn't really care less, you know, uh, and they would still continue to consume uh, these particular commodities, that is, the imported commodities. So, the net effect, uh, you know, of actually uh, giving greater quantum of money or leaving greater quantum of incomes in the hands of the middle classes and the upper segments of the society is that it intensifies uh, the kind of trade deficit and it actually uh, leads to massive uh, uh, you know, outflows of the reserves uh, that we have of uh, you know, the, the foreign currency creating or brewing much greater or, or deepening the entire crisis. Now, as against that, if you were to really uh, you know, try and uh, put the incomes in the hands of the 
poorer sections of the society, not only would their consumption go up, not only would investments in a variety of human development, uh, uh, you know, go up, you know, on the human development indices also we have seen a downfall, we have seen a, uh, you know, degradation or uh, a reduction in our ranking, in the human capital investments ranking. So a variety of these rankings have, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, seen a decline uh, in, in the nation's ranking. So therefore, in terms of an even spread of incomes, it actually creates a more sustainable, a sustained uh, kind of a, a growth. Uh, uh, and apart from, of course, addressing the social issues of justice, uh, inequality, uh, or fixing the uh, you know basic problems, uh, the obligation of which lies very much uh, on the state. Uh, so I think with uh, you know those uh, observations, I'll stop here. If there are any questions, I'm willing to take uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You touched upon you know, the uh, blunders that the Modi government has done from right from the demonetization to the to this current budget, wherein they promised two crore jobs every year. From that to you know having uh, hardly any allocation to uh, basic necessities like food, food subsidy. Looking at the ICDS budget, uh, you know. Uh, and also the education sector, and also how they have uh, cut down the, uh, you know, uh, budget allocations for the minorities and higher education and fellowships and uh, the rest of the things. Thank you. Now I would require uh, request Professor Lakshmi Narayana to uh, address the gathering. Sir, and his masters and PhD from here. His area of interest is political economy and also uh, cast uh, uh, perspectives of uh, economy. Uh, sir has worked as the uh, president of the uh, teachers union earlier. So uh, now I would request <laughs> sir to uh, continue the discussion. Friends, I am very happy to come here because it is uh, organized by Students' Union, University of Hyderabad. That is the reason even if uh, I am little busy and uh, I made it a point to come here and uh, to uh, come to the uh, subject, as you know, that uh, of course, all um, there is no mention of till now. Dr. Vijay spoke about informal sector, unorganized sector. Ninety ninety three percent of the labor force is in unorganized sector, but there is no mention about that in the in the budget that they have presented. So. Budget is important because in a country like ours, particularly, we have all characteristics of underdevelopment. Although we call this our country is a developing country and uh, what not, uh, nowadays they are also saying that uh, it is a fifth largest uh, economy, it is becoming a fifth largest economy. And uh, despite all these things, they we have unemployment, poverty, illiteracy and the basic duty of the government is therefore of course income inequalities. So the basic duty of the government is therefore to make the society little more equal if not completely egalitarian society. And it is also constitutional obligation that in the preamble itself, justice, social, economic, and political. That is a basic objective. And the governments or the political leaders, they promise these constitutional goals will be achieved like that. But if you see what they have done in this budget, to whom 
they have given the benefits of course they say that this is a first budget of amrut kal and amrut kal is 25 years more so in the, and uh, so we have to wait for 25 years <laughs> in order to get something in this uh, so they want in other words they are saying that we will be there up to 25 years so till then you wait whatever problems you have so the problem is that of course uh, what it has done very briefly i will say what it has done for important sectors like say agriculture and education and what it has done for the oppressed sections like scs sts bcs women because one of the objective which they which she finance minister when she was speaking this is a budget for all this budget is made because all will become prosperous now just uh, let me take the agriculture first you know that uh, india still now even now india can be an agricultural country can be called because half of the indian population is still in agriculture so when half of the people are, are there in agriculture what it has done to agriculture of course in the villages what is happening recently now the upper crust of the villages have already left the villages they have come and they have settled in the town and of course within the village those who are not able to get any kind of employment they are coming to the cities you know that in the in the cities they are they are working in uh, construction and staying in slums and in the rural areas also they are not getting employment and in order to address that problem we have mahatma gandhi narega just now spoken now what they have given in this budget to agriculture just let me um, uh, uh, tell you some figures and uh, such an important uh, uh, program like uh, mahatma gandhi narega they have reduced 30000 crores for this program in this budget and and that's why the other what they call rashtriya krishi vikas yojana this is basically for uh, for the development of uh, uh, farmers for that they have reduced from last year 10 1433 crores now they have reduced to 7 7150% drastic fall now as you know that farmers protest farmers have been protesting in this country agriculture is in crisis you have and another thing is there is no mention of remunerative prices minimum support prices whereas farmers are protesting 400 days of agitation in the recent history there was no other agitation 400 days of agitation in the summer winter in the rains they have conducted that agitation there is no mention of minimum support prices so what is this what this budget is doing when so many people are asking about remunerative prices and actually there was a swaminathan commission which says that remunerative prices should be given 50% profit should be given to them but till now the problem is they are appointing committees and commissions only to satisfy some people whenever we ask something they will appoint a committee and after that they think people will forget and they will not implement even the recommendations that are given by these committees so that's why swaminathan committee recommendations were not implemented and even after agitation of the farmers so like that these figures indicate that for 50% of indian population this budget has nothing to give and this is clear and if you don't give anything to agriculture and if there is no in in economics we will say that 
unless you shift the labor force from agriculture to non agricultural sectors you can't have any development because agriculture is a low productivity activity one one reason is one way is to increase the productivity in agriculture but how do you improve the productivity because you are not giving any uh, help to these sectors you are withdrawing all major budget slash in agriculture and for narega in this budget so this is one aspect i i want to uh, say the another is as we know about about uh, education this we can talk later also about education they in, they increased little so far as education is concerned last year it is 1 lakh 4000 crores now it is 1 lakh 12000 crores but of course if you calculate the inflation the effect of inflation on that there is no not much increase rather there may be decrease anyway let us keep it that aside so with this if you see from 2014 onwards in 2014 the allocation for education is 6.1% whereas kotari commission and other committees and commission they are demanding they, they said recommendation is 10% of the central budget but now in this budget they have reduced from 2014 to that is 6% to now just i think just 2. Four percent. How in how education will be improved, and how the human development index. That's why there is always in any ranking you take, India is most backward, and still we claim it is a Vishwa Guru. <laughs> Vishwa Guru has and twenty nine crores of illiterate people, and we say that we are Vishwa Guru in the whole world. so what 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 you are doing in the name of vishwa guru you are reducing budget for education and school education and higher education if you see there are two heads one is revenue expenditure and other is capital expenditure and revenue expenditure as as we all know that it's basically for maintenance for maintenance that will be there. capital expenditure if you see in those documents everywhere there is a dot 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 there is not much allocation for capital expenditure as we as it is said earlier capital expenditure if you allot it will be useful for new infrastructure at least in the in, in the education sector new colleges new universities new buildings even recruitment now when you have no money for capital expenditure here just the out of 45 lakh crores rupees they allotted 12 crores rupees for capital expenditure in the education sector now you can see what importance they are giving so that that is one of the reason why private universities are coming why they are making money in education ashoka university or jindal university fortunately it is the name of, of the corporate people these universities are named after after corporate people so when you do not allot sufficient money for education it will result in the private universities coming and private universities are coming now so and because of which we all know that not only poor middle class people are excluded from education you can i think say for same ma you have to pay lakhs of rupees in that so the other reason is everybody is speaking the asser reports and even the annual survey of higher education they are saying that especially in the school education learning levels are falling and they are they are saying that the say fifth class student is not able to read first class textbook or eighth class student is not able to read fifth class te- textbook then what you have to do of course it's because of pandemic pandemic is one of the reason but i also want to make a point that before that all is well that's not true before pandemic also if you see the standards of learning levels of these children there are there learning levels are falling of course they have fallen very drastically during the pandemic period 
Why? Because you have not provided an infrastructure before also, because every year there is a decrease in the budget for education. So therefore, but it has fallen very fast. So what budget should do? Of course, she, she spoke about, yes, the learning levels have fallen. And what is the solution you have given? You give some digital, national digital library. What you will do with the national digital library? <laughs> the, the children who are not able to read fa a first class textbook, you will say that I will, I will establish a library and some physical library will be established by state government and we will work together to improve the standards of the children. Now, basically as it is said, why, why? Now so much emphasis, we, I am not opposed to technology or uh, 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 computers or all digital technology, etc. But so much emphasis on digital technology now is there is some agreement with these digital companies, these IT companies, only to make money. How much digital literacy we have? And I am sure even MPs don't understand because they are not given budget document. They are asked to see in computers. I don't think they have seen anything because that's why they are, they are doing this. Always, you, you can see how many times they have done this kind of thing. And when Prime Minister does this, all will do. <laughs> because whatever he does is right. And sometimes what they are doing, fiscal deficit, it is actually, it should be less, at least for the time being, fiscal deficit should be less. But when finance minister is saying that fiscal deficit is this much, little higher, they are, they are also doing this because they think anything higher is good. <laughs> <laughs> anything higher is good. So since a, so PM is also clapping, so we should also do it. So this digital technology, that's why in the name of digital technology, what, how you can improve the standards of the uh, uh, st learning levels of the children, even I, I, I am sure even state university, they are little better. You go to state university, I went to Kakate University for a PhD viva, I just asked how many teachers are there, only one teacher, in the entire university one permanent teacher, all others are contract. So when you have a contract and guest lectures, what kind of standards we will have? So therefore, uh, without uh, elaborating on education, we can have discussion later also. One more thing I want to uh, also give you uh, attention to it. Uh, this is, of course, uh, my personal opinion. There is a systematic reduction on the funds given to minorities. Religious minorities, there is a systematic reduction, we have to understand this. Why they are doing this? Recently we know, they have removed the Maulana Azad National Fellowships. What is the reason why you have removed? There is a some, definitely they have some objective as we know. And there is nothing to hide. They want to establish Hindu Rashtra, in which they think there should not be any religious minorities. There is no place for them. There is no education. Not only in this. Actually, again, to give just two, three figures for educational empowerment. There is 2015 crores last year. This year, they have reduced to 1,618 crores. Pre-metric scholarship, they have reduced from 1,425 crores to 433 crores. And I will, I can go on, MCM scholarships they have reduced from 365 crores to just 44 crores. All, this is all for religious minorities. And for madrasas they have reduced from 193 crores to 10 crores. So why this is happening we have to think. So especially there is a, there, there is a, a plan to not to give any kind of benefits to this kind of section. And the, I think last point I, I want to make about the, um, about, uh, they also said that this, this budget is for SC, ST, OBC, and also this women, farmers, farmers anyway we have seen. Now, if you see, say even Suppose people talk about gender, gender budgeting. How much percentage you have allotted, allotted 
for the benefit of women in this budget the proportion of the population is approximately around 49% but if you see what are the direct benefits for them it is just 9% and similarly for sc population you have around 16% of sc population and there you will give 3% to them so for whom this budget you say this is for scs this is for women then what what percentage you are allotting at least you should allot in proportion to their population and sts for sts it is their percentage is maybe around 9% but you have given 2% in the entire budget but just by showing i am not opposed just by showing the president belong to say scheduled tribe community okay this is good it is required it is their right mm. you have not given as a dan it is a right but is it sufficient that what about the adivasis and their status education just 6% in higher education tribals their gross enrollment ratio in higher education just 6% and there you keep entire community as backward no education no health facilities people die in forest whenever there is rainy season no drinking water no safe drinking water you don't give that but you will say that this budget is for them so like this whatever sections they have mentioned so so i i want to just conclude by saying it is not for agriculture it is not for education it is not for scs it is not for sts it is not for bcs all but because there is no statistics in bcs when bc organizations are asking we want caste census they are keeping silent why you are keeping silent let truth come out who is there how much proportion of the population but their fear is and i was told that these ruling party leaders have that data also but they are not giving to others they are using for election purpose then what is this election in this in this country if you have contest election you will say to which caste he belongs how many reddies are there how many lingayats are there huh? how, how many ayangars are there is this a democracy this is a shame in this country in this election in the election you do all these things but when it comes to the question of some statistics to help you don't want to do it caste census till now they have not agreed why they are not agreeing to that so it is not for them it is not for surely sts they are more backward at least in terms of education so but last point is i for whom this budget is in the main that person you all know that you know according to oxfam report 1% of corporate sector I, i i can say they own 40% of country's wealth how much inequality you can imagine just 1% of the and all these corporate sectors as just said earlier even this taxation why you reduce your tax at a higher higher income brackets at higher income brackets they have reduced some 3 to 4% to them 25 lakhs saving generally salaried people may say that no no it is helpful for us helpful for us that may be okay but but at higher level actually progressive taxation means if you go to higher level if you have more incomes there it they have to be taxed more instead of that what here it is happening if you go higher the taxation is becoming less it is completely regressive taxation so you have income inequalities like that you have wealth inequalities by the way wealth inequality wealth tax has been abolished who abolished same government same government in 2016 you have abolished wealth tax why you are 1% of the super rich owning 40% of wealth what inequality it is there article 39 says concentration of wealth in the hands of few should be stopped 
at least cons at least we are at least nobody is saying that you remove all inequality but at least reduce inequalities it is increasing and increasing wealth tax has been abolished no inheritance tax no wealth tax and income tax is like this so to whom this for super rich and corporate sector for 1% if i can make for 1% this budget so therefore all of us 99% if you really see 99% of the population now their interests are not served for 1% they want to some opposition what for whatever reason good or bad opposition are demanding some committee on the um, what adani they are saying no we will not appoint a committee then back the report came out it is a it is a basically fraud in the name of business what adani has done it is a fraud on this fraud to have a committee why you are afraid of it what is the problem with you everybody knows they are financing your election you have traveled in his private airplane that is the reason you are protecting protecting the corporate sector so therefore for this kind of they are afraid of corporate sector they are for the corporate actually they are by the corporate like that this entire budget also if you see of course there are many more details many more sectors are there but it basically it is worked in the interest of the corporate sector and small small benefits here and there of course when you have a so much so much budget some small things may be there but in the main that is what this budget uh, means i don't want to continue with these few words i conclude thanking you all once again to the students union thank you sir clearly uh, pointed out the way the uh, finance minister has mentioned about the scs sts minorities obcs and women uh, by specifying them uh, they've clearly they've stated that the budget is not for them and they are only protecting the interests of the 1% industries whom they are you know uh, trying to protect by giving various subsidies and various uh, uh, incentives in the in the Uh, respect to uh, reducing the tax to the higher uh, income group and also by uh, you know uh, taxing the uh, lower middle class and middle class uh, that way they are trying to you know get down uh, the uh, trying to increase uh, the income uh, parity level that's there in the country now i would request the uh, students union president abhishek nand to uh, give vote of thanks Oh, my bad, my bad. Sorry. Before we close, I would uh, request if there are any questions, uh, we would take some. Good evening, sir. I'm John Michael from Ahmed Political Science. Uh, yesterday, I was reading the Hindu newspaper, and in every page, there is one industrialist telling that this is a great budget. And towards the end, uh, some opposition parties' leaders' opinion was given. So, a discussion like this. in a, in a, in university spaces critically looking at it and laying uh, bare and exposing uh, the actual realities is very important and i thank you for delivering this lectures and i thank the students union for organizing it my question is about education itself and higher education so um, the the research scholars do not receive their fellowships on time and mana fee is re removed the teachers do not receive their salary i read it in hindu our university teachers did not receive their salary on time and uh, one friend from physics told that the research machines and tools are going to be much more costlier now uh, and on top of that ugc releases a letter saying uh, give your spaces on rent to private players and uh, earn money on that uh, and uh, raise your own revenues so in this context how are we in education higher education going to be affected uh, through this budget more Michael. Now the basic uh, aim of the reduction in the budget for education is to destroy public education, because public education can be protected only when you allot required amount of money for education, which you are not doing. 
so even all universities are asked to raise their own resources how do they raise their resources a public university like ours how do they raise their you know their resources the only way is you increase the fees of the students actually that is the indirect message now first they are saying that you rent this this auditorium you rent that auditorium you get some money like that but after after some time what they do is how do they how do you raise this you you can't public institution is not for earning profit public education unfortunately in this country including ourselves we think that saraswati is a god and we will sell saraswati in the bazaar for ma 5 lakhs for mba 20 lakhs for medical 1 crore 1 crore for one seat we sell this education we will say no no we are saraswati god who are selling god so this public education that's why of course fellowships will be removed now first started with the minorities there is some quotation first they came for us after that they came for somebody else after that i thought anyway they have not come for us and when they came for me nobody remained so it started with minorities tomorrow all fellowship now what they are do saying is you take loans we don't give fellowships we don't give scholarships what do you do you go to bank and take loans and i loan when there is no guarantee of employment and by the way this budget doesn't talk about layoffs now layoffs are going on everywhere all it companies are removing jobs people from jobs that is not talked about when there is no assurance of employment what loan actually my student was saying her brother took a loan from the bank and he is not able to pay because he has no job he didn't get job then what they did was this bank people they pasted his photo in all branches of that bank in that area something like a a decoit but they don't do anything to the adani who looted sbi is sbi people so much interested in collecting money from the farmers for not paying their loan and harassing student they don't do, they don't do anything for these people so where so that's why the important point is that students of the public universities if you go to private university and ask them they say that they don't want to do anything they are not worried about others of course those who are really strong people both in all the ways i am saying they will stand with the weak only those timid people weak people they join with the strong people public university produces organic intellectuals the intellectuals who fight for their communities their their classes from they where they came from in the in the language of gramshi it produces organic intellectuals these organic intellectuals have to protect these universities otherwise otherwise what is there in private university you may be a technocrat you may earn thousand uh, lakhs and lakhs of rupees but in times of human what is there what what remains there you are only worried about yourself what is there anybody so many people are there like that in british period also all ias people all top fellows that is what mekale called we want dalals from this country who are these dalals educated section clerks the clerks are worried about themselves they could not speak before the british officials what 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 human qualities they have to be human being we have to protect the public university and to work for the people weakest people or talk about them we require public universities so that's why i think this is one of the place where we have always been raising voice both the students and teachers to protect the university i appeal to you and nep is one of that nep is saying that we want foreign universities we want private universities we don't want to give money and as you are saying even teachers also should not be in a illusion 
they think that anyway we are getting 3 lakhs, 4 lakhs, nothing will happen. As you said, they are not given salary for one, one, one day, they are saying, oh, something happened to us. They are not worried when something happened to others. So therefore, my point is, it is we as a group, I think we should not allow even this administration, administration is always siding with them to do such kind of things. So, with this, um, anything. Well, I think uh, just to add, uh, it, it connects back to the whole uh, general agreement in uh, you know the tra trade in services, uh, where Indian government has uh, actually agreed to open up uh, education and health and such other uh, services. We have always been uh, looking at these as uh, part of the service sector, uh, not as uh, you know for profit. Uh, you know, kind of uh, entities. But now that you have opened it up, uh, it basically boils down to the idea of competition. And uh, when you are therefore competing, uh, because uh, it has been converted into a commodity, there is also a certain kind of a standardization that uh, has entered. So you are asked to standardize. So uh, this whole idea of uh, reducing the number of years of education to four years is more to match up with the you know kind of systems that are there in the United States. Uh, you have uh, clearly spelt out hierarchy which is uh, attached to the API points. Uh, you have this uh, you know the entire uh, uh, structuring that is done in the you know institutes of uh, eminence uh, which is again based on the uh, you know rankings and points that uh, universities have. Now, while on one hand this is happening, just the way that we see what is happening with uh, you know the public sector industries. See, in this budget, that's I think one thing that we have not really touched upon, which is that uh, when you create a budget which has a massive uh, you know kind of a deficit, uh, one of the methods through which they would like to finance it is by way of uh, you know divestment, that is disinvestment in uh, or rather sale of uh, you know public sector uh, enterprises. Now, university is also similarly seen on parallel with that kind of a structure where you are uh, in a sense disinvesting in a public asset and uh, you are slowly moving into the realm of uh, the public sector. So, a modification of education alongside uh, you know, marketization uh, and encouraging competition. So, therefore, as part of IOE, if you saw what was happening with reference to the way that the uh, funds were being allocated, they also funded uh, some of the private universities along with uh, you know the public institutions. So this is the idea that you are creating a level playing field, uh, and therefore you are uh, not being unfair, right, by funding public institutions. So this is a peculiarity of it that today a public institution has to compete uh, on par with private institutions, uh, whereas the original idea of a university. Uh, was to really, uh, you know, explore the universe of ideas. So you have vocational institutions in order to create application skills. So you, you have vocational skills being created by, uh, you know, vocational institutions. Whereas universities uh, basically deal with basic science and research. So it's basic research. Like for instance, Newton will be unemployed today because uh, you know his his knowledge has no direct. Uh, in that sense application unless you convert it into some kind of a machine or uh, you know some concrete tool right so would perhaps einstein einstein might also end up being an unemployed right so all these uh, that have uh, that have made path breaking kind of uh, explorations and uh, uh, you know knowledge contributions to science the question that we are being asked today is in what way does it really help an individual get a job but that's not quite the purpose of a university. A university has, you know, the larger purpose of creating knowledge. And knowledge might eventually convert it into, you know, several applications. So it's, it's uh, the level at which you analyze its contribution, the value that you see is very different. But today it is based on how market perceives, uh, how, you know, uh, the students are being converted into consumers, the teachers into sellers. So therefore, we are, uh, you know, being asked to float such courses which are saleable, right? And the entire course itself is seen like a platter, like, you know, what happens if you walk into a pizza 
hut or you know some uh, pizza center you are asked you know which particular vegetable or which particular sauce you want the credit based uh, you know that uh, uh, the, the, the entire choice of course uh, courses right choice based credit system is more or less like that you have no notion of a core in the discipline you are neither trained in a particular uh, discipline nor do you have the depth to explore uh, knowledge in any meaningful way so whatever is your perception about you know what might be useful is the basis for your choice so that i so those, those are the kinds of complications that have entered into the system going to room now i'll eat i'll eat her then i'll come to we can take one last question to take the printer to printer this is not enough all right i think uh, the uh, discussion was so comprehensive that i don't think we have any questions in this regard i would like to uh, invite our union president abhishek nandan to give vote of thanks to our uh, speakers of the day thank you sir uh, students union ki taraf se bahut bahut dhanyawad aur hamara ye manna hai ki jo budget मोदी गवर्नमेंट के नौवे साल में आया है इस बजट पे सबसे ज्यादा बात करने बात करने की जरूरत है क्योंकि तो जैसा कि सर बता रहे थे ये पहली दफा है पिछले आठ साल में कि जो काम करते हैं गांव में लोग नरेगा का मनरेगा का उसका फंड कट हुआ है उन्हें जो सरकारी आवास योजना जो मिलता था जिसमें लगभग एक लाख तीस हजार रुपया उन, उनको दिया जाता था दो कमरा बनाने के लिए उसमें लगभग साठ करोड़ से ज्यादा का बजट कट हुआ है और इसके साथ साथ जो फूड सब्सिडी और फर्टिलाइजर सब्सिडी देश के किसानों को दिया जाता था उसमें लगभग नब्बे हजार करोड़ से ज्यादा की फंड कटौती हुई है इसके साथ साथ जो एनईपी में सरकार ने खुद के डॉक्यूमेंट में जो वादा किया था जो रिकमेंडेशन था कि जीडीपी का सिक्स परसेंट जो है हम बजट पे शिक्षा पे खर्च करेंगे एजुकेशन पे ढाई से भी कम जो है बजट पे खर्च करने जा रही है सरकार और उसमें से एक बड़ा जो मद है वो इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर बिल्डअप करने के लिए अलाउट एल, हुआ आ, हुआ है आज हमारे कैंपसों में इसीलिए जरूरी है कि बजट के माध्यम से सर, सरकार का जो चरित्र है उसको लोगों तक ले जाने की जिम्मेदारी हमारी है और हम यूनियन से आगे भी पर्चा और टॉक ये जो बजट आया है इस पर करवाते रहेंगे आप लोगों का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद अभिषेक एक एक लास्ट पॉइंट आई वांट टू मेक सी आई थिंक दिस काइंड ऑफ अ ब्राह्मणिकल टेक इन टर्म्स ऑफ द वे दैट द बजट गोस एंड वन हैज टू रियली अंडरस्टैंड दिस दैट द ब्राह्मणिकल कंस्ट्रक्ट इज दैट द अपर एक्स ऑफ द सोशल लैडर आर वेरी इंटेलिजेंट पीपल दैट बॉर्न इंटेलिजेंट एंड द लोअर एक आर एसेंशियली यू नो एक्सट्रीमली इमोटिव पीपल January 2024, you will have the Ram Temple constructed. Now the idea is that the euphoria around that and the kind of hatred that uh, is likely to be whipped up against the minorities that they think would feed, uh, you know, whatever is required to get the votes. So the investments and the budget allocations, the benefits go to the upper echelons of the society. and the emotions are likely to feed the lower ranks of the society this is a very very casteist kind of a take of how the entire perspective on economy is working so kindly keep in mind that there is a very very significant role that culture uh, is likely to play here in terms of how a government can get away by making a budget which is completely anti people and yet expect that it is likely to win this is an election year and they just not bother they don't care because this is their perspective about the common sense and uh, you know common individuals i think that also we need to understand thank you sir thank you